today's video, we're going over progressive tendon loading for patellar tendinopathy. Three more reps. So patellar tendinopathy can be a very debilitating condition, it tends to recur and stick around way longer than we actually want it to. A study by Katunin in 2002 in patients that had patellar tendinopathy, 50% of those athletes ended up retiring and they cited the reason for retiring being the patellar tendon. So debilitating, but also can force folks to retire. Not so good. So eccentrics are often cited as a gold standard for treating tendinopathies like patellar tendinopathies. However, we know that a variety of different types of contractions be beneficial. So things like isometrics, concentrics, eccentrics, all that stuff can be pretty good. And a pretty cool study in 2021 by Breda et al. showed that we combine some of these in a progressive fashion. So starting with isometrics and working our way up to isotonics and then jumping, we actually had a better outcome compared to performing eccentric only exercises. So in today's video, I'm gonna peel back the curtain and show exactly how they perform the progressive loading protocol so you can use this with your patients and improve your outcomes. My name is Dan Pope from fitnesspainfree.com. I'm a physical therapist, I'm a strength coach. We help thousands of athletes through our courses, community, and mentoring. My goal for you today is to make you 1% better. So in the progressive tendon loading group, what was the first intervention the patients got? It was patient education. What were they educated on? Basically, they're educated that exercise is going to be beneficial for patellar tendinopathy. The other piece is that they're educated on a progressive loading scheme being better than starting with higher level exercises that are maybe too aggravating for the area. So they're educated about the stages of rehab, starting with isometrics or the easiest exercises on the tendon, then progressing to isotonics, a little harder, progressing to jumping or energy storage exercises, and lastly, returning back to sport slowly. Patients also got education about what's acceptable from a pain perspective with their sport activities, as well as what's okay from a rehab perspective. They used a pain monitoring model. Essentially, if the pain was three out of 10 or less on a zero out of 10 scale, that pain was acceptable. As long as the next day, during a single-legged squat task, your pain was back down to baseline. And they used this in order to figure out which activities were okay from a sporting perspective. So if running feels okay, but cutting does not, you can still run, but you have to stay away from those sport specific activities. They also use this as a way to figure out what was okay from a rehab perspective. Starting with exercise a little bit easier, and as pain gets better, we just went harder and harder over the course of time, listening to those pain parameters the entire way through. So stage number one was isometrics. The folks in this study were in this stage for one to two weeks. They may have been there a little bit longer if they're more irritable, and if they weren't that irritable, maybe a little bit less. I'm gonna show you exactly what they used in this study with Tyler here. He's got a red hot patellar tendon right there, and we'll see if we can cool it down. So in stage one, patients were told to perform isometrics. They had four different options. They didn't perform all four options. They chose one of those. If patients had access to it, they would use a knee extension machine. And essentially, you wanna load up the knee extension machine so it's heavy enough that when you get to 60 degrees of knee extension, you've got about 70% of your maximal voluntary contraction. So about a seven out of 10 intensity. And folks held this isometric contraction for 45 seconds and they rested for two minutes in between sets and they did five total sets. So if patients didn't have access to a knee extension machine, they were told to perform an, a leg press machine in the same fashion. So essentially setting it up at a 60 degree knee flexion angle putting the weight pin stack all the way to the bottom so you can't move the weight, and then pushing at about a 70% of what you feel like your max is. So if the patients didn't have access to leg press or knee extension, they were told to do a wall sit variation. And it's the same idea, so going down to 60 degrees of knee flexion, again, we're trying to get a seven out of 10 intensity. So if it was too easy from this standpoint, and they had athletes go on one leg, can you show me that real quick, Tyler? Yep, going down to 60 degrees. And if they're doing really well with this variation, you need to load them up more. I actually just gave him a little bit of weight and go ahead and descend down to 60 and holding there. So again, five sets, 45 seconds, two minutes rest in between, and individuals were asked to perform this daily, just one of these movements, not all four. After individuals were tolerating stage one really well, they moved to stage two or the isotonic phase. So just like in stage one, we're performing an isometric exercise, we're now performing an isotonic exercise. And if patients had access to a knee extension machine, this was the exercise they're asked to perform. Now, when they were doing the exercises, they started with four sets of 15 repetitions. And over the course of time, as pain went down, and athletes got stronger, they went down to four sets of six. 
So the idea was to start with high repetitions because generally you can't use as much load and the tendon is more irritable, so it can't handle that load. And as the tendon gets better over the course of time, we lower the rep range, which would increase the weight. So now that tendon has to handle more and more load. So if that individual didn't have access to a knee extension machine, he would just perform the same exact thing in a leg press machine. And if patients didn't have access to a knee extension or a leg press, they could perform a walking lunge. So go ahead and take one step forward and push back. We'll alternate between your sides. Very good. And they could also perform a step up as well, which you probably don't need to because all you need is the ground in order to do a lunge. So maybe just do that. But at least in this study, they're given the option of a step up or a lunge. You can take a breather here, Tyler. And keep in mind, they didn't do all of these exercises. They just choose one, most often the knee extension if they actually had access to it. So in this phase, the isotonics were performed every other day and isometrics were performed on off days. So Monday would be your isotonics, then Tuesday would be your isometrics, Wednesday's isotonics, isometrics, so on and so forth. So after patients were tolerating the isotonic phase really well, they went from high reps down to low reps, they're tolerating this within those pain parameters, it's time to move on to the next phase with the energy storage phase. And essentially, in this phase, individuals were performing jumping exercises. And in any of these jumping exercises, unlike the other phases, they included all of the exercises and they progressed them over the course of time. So in isotonic and isometric, they chose one exercise. For the energy storage phase, they were choosing multiple exercises, which we'll go over right now. All right, so the first exercise was the squat jump. In the squat jump, they progressed from lower jumps to higher jumps, and they progressed from jumping with two legs, landing on two legs, to jumping on two legs and landing on one leg. Show me a low squat jump first. Very good, and then go ahead again. Nice, let's do the same thing, just higher. Good, big jump, land, another big jump, good. Now show me a double-legged jump with a single-legged landing. Boom, excellent. So essentially, they performed three sets of 10, and they started with these low, went to higher, and single-legged, based on the pain parameters. So if individuals weren't ready for the single-legged landing, they didn't start with it, but they were doing great, they progressed right to it a little bit faster. Next was a split jump. So essentially, they did the same thing, three sets of 10. They started with a lower jump, progressed to a higher jump, and over the course of time, they actually increased the amount of total sets. So three sets of 10, working up to six sets of 10. All right, Tyler, you mind showing me a few split jumps here? Alternating between legs, jump switch, jump switch. Excellent, let's go a little higher. Perfect, awesome, looking good. Next thing he went over was a box jump. And essentially started with a lower box and they progressed to a higher box over the course of time. And not only did they do a box jump, they did a box landing. So go ahead and jump up on this box for me, nice soft landing, yep. Now step off the end and land with two legs. Good, nice soft landing. Let's have you walk right back to the start. As athletes progress over the course of time, not only did they raise that box up, they also started to land with one leg. So go ahead and jump up for me, Tyler. And when you step off, yep, that was perfect. And then the second time you step, you just land right on one leg. Perfect. So they're advancing this movement by jumping higher, but also just by going to one leg when you landed. Next, they had a running drill, basically four cones. And the athletes were asked to start accelerating when they approached the second cone, accelerate through the third, and stop by the fourth. So go ahead and show me that, Tyler. Running, see, accelerate, accelerate, yep, and break down and then stop. Very good, and they're walking right back to the start, and they're repeating for repetitions. Once the first running drill was tolerated well, they moved to a zigzag drill. Essentially, you have six cones set up as seen, and you have your athlete zigzag through those cones. You mind showing me that real quick, Tyler? Running through, round the cone, very good. Cutting, very good. Cutting, very good. Yep, and when your athlete finishes up, they just walk back to the start. So, for the energy storage and release phase, these exercises were performed every third day. So essentially, Monday would be your energy storage day, and then Tuesday would be your isotonic day, and then Wednesday would be your isometric day, then you would go back on Thursday to the energy storage and release. Once your athlete is tolerating that really well, we progress some more sports specific exercises. Now, they didn't really give an idea of which specific activities they used in the study, but the idea is that if you have a basketball athlete, once you get back to basketball, we can start including the ball, doing more specific drills like shuffling, as well as jumping. So we can do a drill just like the one seen here. Let's go ahead and start shuffling for me, Tyler. Very good. Back and forth. So we're starting to incorporate a little hand-eye, a little bit more of the sport specific activities that you see. So in this phase, they started with doing sports specific exercises two to three days per week, but the goal was to advance closer to what the sport the athlete has to participate in. So increasing the frequency, doing longer sessions over the course of time, and eventually introducing some group training. 
in this space, they also phase out the ISO metrics, but they continued up with the isotonics two days per week. So obviously in this study, you should change up your exercises based on the sport that your athlete wants to get back to. My sport is dominating YouTube, so I recommend liking this video and again, subscribing. It's gonna make me great. So through the entirety of the study, they utilize exercises to mitigate potential risk factors for gaining patellar tendon opti. And a few of those are going to be weakness in the glutes, weakness in the calves, as well as having some stiffness in a variety of different muscles. So the first exercise we're gonna talk about are gonna be stretching exercises. And they performed three sets of 30 second stretch for each of these areas. The first was just a good old calf stretch against the wall, the gastroc bias with the legs straight. They also performed a soleus stretch, which would be the same stretch with the knee bent. After that, they did a standing quad stretch, just pulling that leg back, big stretch there. And lastly, good old hamstring stretch, going down and touching the toes. Three sets, 30 seconds, three times a week. For the strengthening exercises, they worked on the calf, three sets of 15, go ahead for it. And they did this three times per week during the entire study. Three sets of 15, band abduction. Three by 15 of sideline abduction. Three by 15 of single-legged glute bridges. Nice, solid. So again, starting with easy exercises, isometrics, progressing to isotonics, progressing to your plyometrics, and then slowly returning back to sport over the course of time. In this study, they deemed the athletes were ready to return to sport once they're able to perform their sporting activities within those pain parameters. And then as best you can, you probably wanna slowly progress back to playing. All right, so now you have an idea of how to start with easy exercises and progress to hard ones. There's actually a really cool paper where they looked at all of the most common exercises in a rehab setting for patellar tendinopathy, and they graded them from easiest all the way up to hardest. And I went over all of those, and I have a link in the corner. If you go ahead and click on that, take you right to that video where I'll show you how to progress from easy to hard. Click on that link, and I'll see you there.